Yes, Mr. Chu Choi. Um, uh, we feel we're not really in a um, position since you lost half a day to deny your request that we start at 10 tomorrow. I do only make this observation that um, by uh, my, as they tell me, their usual standards, we have been, uh, haven't intervened very much. So I don't think it's one of those cases where you have been um, slowed down by uh, a relentless battering from the court. But anyway, so but that will be it, I'm afraid, in terms of indulgence. Very good. Um, so, my lord, um, the next topic is the, um, the what we call the erroneous characterisation of jurisdictional factors um, as grounds of abuse of process. Um, and um, as I said earlier, by jurisdictional factors, I mean those factors that are relevant to whether England is an appropriate jurisdiction in which to bring and try the claims against the relevant defendant. Um, we saw earlier the judge's reference to those jurisdictional factors. I don't think we need to go through those passages again. Uh, for reference, paragraph uh, 86 um, and paragraphs where he refers to the risk of inconsistent judgments if the claims were allowed to continue in England, and then paragraphs 108, language 110, need for a large quantity of translations, 111, danger of translation errors, 113, the need for the English court to apply Brazilian law, 114, the difficulty in having witnesses giving video link evidence from Brazil. The critical feature of all of these factors is that they are not aimed at supporting the contention that there should be no claims against the respondents at all in any jurisdiction. Rather, they are aimed at the contention that the claims in question are not being appropriately pursued in England. Yet, an objection as to a the appropriateness of England as the jurisdiction uh, of the claims must necessarily be resolved in accordance with well-established principles. Namely, in the case of BHPPLC, an English domiciled defendant, by reference to the jurisdictional rules contained in the Brussels Recast Regulation, um, and as regards BHP Limited, by reference to uh, foreign non-convenience principles originally laid down in Spiliada and recently adjusted by Lord Briggs um, in the Supreme Court's decision in the Vedanta case, which I will come to later. Um, it is those jurisdictional rules and principles that regulate the appropriateness of claims in England um, uh, as opposed to somewhere else, not abuse of process principles. Um, and uh, to hold otherwise and essentially import abuse of process principles into this area creates a real risk of undermining, fundamentally undermining, um, the well-established principles such as in Urusu and Jackson concerning the, the sacri sacrosanct nature of a claimant's right to sue an English domicile defendant in England free from jurisdictional challenge upon foreign non convenience grounds, even where the competing candidates for jurisdiction are England and a non-member state. Um, I, I don't think that I need to take you to Urusu, um, because it's probably well known to the court. Uh, but uh, for reference, um, and, and just to make sure that it finds its way into the hard copy bundle, which you may find useful later, uh, it's at tab 78 of the bundle of authorities um, in the trial bundle. Uh, and uh, the passages of particular interest are paragraphs 8 to 9, 22, 34 to 41, and 43 to 45. Um, Vedanta has a very, sorry, it's a very long list of paragraphs, but perhaps I can... Will, will, will it sort of find its way into our appeal authorities' bundles? Um, uh, we, will, um, we will do that. Yes, that's, well, that's what I thought you were saying. No, I think you were just giving us some electronic trial bundle references. Yes, um, I, I, it's not. It's not in the. I'm afraid it's not yet in the hard copy bundle. Um, no, but I thought you were that. saying that it would be. It, it will be there, yes, but it's not yet. Um, um, we can. We, we can. I'm sure someone could might be able to run off some copies before before. No, don't worry. As long as it finds its way into the official authorities bundle, that's my With part, those that's, paragraphs sidelined. Yes, absolutely. Um, but but what, in the meantime, what we can do briefly, um, because I think it'll it'll help, is to look at Vedanta, which is in the bundle of authorities at um, in bundle D at tab thirty. If 
I could ask you to look at um, the, the particular claims, uh, the, the facts don't matter, although you may recall that, um, that the facts are broadly familiar to, to the court, because we looked at um, one of the other iterations of that litigation um, uh, in, in the um, uh, in Mr. Justice Fraser. Um, but if your lordship, if the court looks at um, page 1045, letter H, just the beginning of the head notes, the, 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 the holding, um, Point one, um, and if you read over the page to um, the last, um, the, the very first page of the report, one zero four five. I'm so sorry. I was looking at the internal pagination. One eight nine nine of the bundle. Forgive me. So on the defendant's appeals held that it was act clear from the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the European Communities that Article 4 of the regulation conferred a right on any claimant, regardless of their domicile, to sue an English domicile defendant in England, free from jurisdictional challenge upon forum non-convenience grounds, even where the compelling, competing candidate for jurisdiction is a non-member state, and that any exceptions to the otherwise automatic and mandatory effect of Article 4 had to be narrowly construed. Um, and um, uh, and um, if you then go to paragraph 16, I could ask you to read that, and also paragraph 17, which becomes relevant in a moment. Then um, 39 and 40. Paragraph 17 contains the state. Sorry, I haven't a chance. If you really want us to read that, I'm so sorry. Properly. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Yep. Um, and. Um, you will note that in the first sentence of paragraph 17, Lord Briggs says, this does not, of course, prevent any defendant from seeking to have a claim struck out as an abusive process, uh, or as disclosing no reasonable cause of action, or from seeking reverse summary judgment upon the basis that the claim discloses no trial issue against the defendant. There's, a, there's an, an issue between parties as to, well, what significance to attribute, uh, one should attribute to the reservation or the, the statement about um, the principle um, from a Rusu not preventing a defendant from seeking to uh, apply to a claim struck out uh, as an abusive process. I'll come back to that if I may, but I'll just highlight the particular relevance of that sentence at this stage. Now, the judge rightly acknowledged the importance of the Rusu as um, exemplified by Vedanta in his judgment at paragraph 80 uh, and 81. Which page on the authorities from you? Sorry. Uh, may I ask for the uh, page number of the authorities bundle? Um, it's not necessary for Opus because we, we have the hard copy, so thank you. Um, the, um, um, going back to the judgment, paragraph 80, um, you will see the judge recorded the effect of Urusu. Um, and um, and he also went on to say, paragraph 81, I would thus readily accept, and the defendants concede, that it would be impermissible to deploy an abusive process argument in order to achieve through the back door that which the recast regulation bars through the front door. Nevertheless, in cases in which the risk of irreconcilable judgments is just one of a number of factors relevant to the exercise of the abuse jurisdiction, it should not be ignored. Now, it is that last proposition that we say is not sustainable in the light of Urusu and Vedanta, either as a matter of logic or as a matter of authority. 
Um, starting with logic, once it is accepted, as the judge rightly did in the first sentence of paragraph 81, uh, that the risk of irreconcilable judgments cannot be relied upon as a backdoor route to denying a defendant's uh, a claimant's right under Article 4 of the regulation to sue an English domicile defendant in England, um, where, at least when the claimant has an admittedly arguable claim, then it cannot matter whether the risk of irreconcilable judgments is relied upon on its own or together with uh, other factors. Um, in the light of a Rousseau, it is no more permissible to rely on this consideration on its own than to rely on it in combination with um, other factors. And, and um, in other words, putting it sort of rather simply, uh, without wishing to be flippant uh, about it, zero remains zero, where even when you add it to positive numbers. Uh, whether the other factors uh, may themselves constitute an abusive process is, of course, a different question. Um, as regards authority, if we go to the judgment, the judge cited two passages that he considered supported this approach. First, he cited... Mr. Justice Coulson in the Lungo, in the, in the uh, first instance decision in Vedanta, and then Lord Briggs at paragraph 17 of Vedanta. Now, just to be clear, the passage um, uh, from the judgment of Mr. Justice Coulson in Lungo and Vedanta, um, you will um, uh, find that um, in, um, well, um, in, in the bundle, um, which is. Um, in the additional bundle, wasn't this? No, th this is the first. Um, th that was a different one. Um, this is bu uh, this is um, a bundle C, tab twenty nine. Tab what? Sorry. Uh, bundle C, tab twenty nine, uh, and if you. Um, <clears throat> particular passage that the judge relies on in um, paragraph 84, um, if you go to page 877 at the bottom of um, the bundle, there's a section um, called um, section 10.3, a stay on case management grounds, just above paragraph 84. So the, the, the passage, therefore, in Mr. Justice Coulson's speech uh, that's cited by the judge um, was not about the power to strike out proceedings on the ground of abusive process, um, still less a striking out uh, in reliance on a perceived risk of irreconcilable judgments. It was a passage about the exercise of the court's power uh, to stay uh, proceedings before it on case management grounds, even if the court has jurisdiction pursuant to Article 4. That was the um, particular um, context um, for that um, passage in Mr. Justice Wilson's judgment. Um, but what is more, even the court's residual power to grant the case management stay with respect to proceedings brought against an English domicile defendant is very narrowly circumscribed um, in particular, it is only exercisable in rare um, and compelling circumstances, the point that we see in paragraph 85 uh, of Mr. Justice Coulson's uh, judgment in Lungo. Um, but critically, for present purposes, um, that power cannot and must not be exercised by reference to consideration of the risk of irreconcilable judgments or other forum non-convenience factors. This is not totally apparent from 83 to 86 uh, of uh, Mr. Justice Wilson's judgment, but it is very apparent from uh, two other cases in the, uh, in, um, in the next bundle of authorities, bundle D. Um, so so, so you say, well, even on a case management stay application, you uh, are not allowed to refer to the risk of irreconcilable judgments and uh, forum non-convenience factors, is that right? Correct. In, in an Article 4 case. Um, 
Just give me the name of the two cases you're going to take. So the first case is, my note. Yes, so the first case is Mazur Media. What's the other one? And the other one is Mad Atelier. Okay. Now, Mazur Media, uh, you will find in bundle D at tab 34. And I think I can take you straight to the relevant passages. Um, first at paragraph 69, and then at paragraph Which paragraph? So paragraph 69, 69 is where the judge refers to the power to stay on case management grounds and makes the point that that power cannot be used in a manner which is inconsistent with the judgment's regulation. And then further down, where the court has jurisdiction under the judgment's regulation, the power of the court to stay proceedings cannot be used simply because another regulation stated the forum non convenience. The case. judge wasn't taken to Missouri, was he? I believe. Um, he, he was taken to Ms. Right. Media. It's not in his judgment, though. It may not be. Don't worry. That's fine. Thank you. Um, but I, I believe he was taken to Mad, Mad Atelier. Yes, he was taken to Mad Atelier. Yes. yes. Which, which, in fact, summarises the point even more well. Oh. Certainly as clearly, but so we go more, to it. more recently. But the key passage is, um, in addition to 69, is 71, um, where... Mr. Justice Lawrence Collins, as he, as he then was, says, in my judgment, none of the taxes relied on by the GMBH is such individually or collectively as to amount to such exceptional circumstances to grant a stay, justify a stay, and then if, if you read the next sentence, and, and then over the page. Um, see in particular the reference there to the multiplicity of proceedings and danger of inconsistent judgments. I do not consider that these are legitimate considerations in a case where the court has jurisdiction and the judgment's regulation. So even in the context of the case management stay jurisdiction, let alone striking out on grounds of abusive process, even there the power over Rusu is, uh, occupies the field um, and, and really dictates serious limitations on what you can or can't take into account. Uh, and then Mad Atelier, in fact, is in the same bundle at tab 31. Um, uh, in particular, if you go to uh, paragraph 82, subparagraphs 1 to 4, so that's page 966 of the bundle. The first authority, therefore, that the judge cited as supposed a support um, for the proposition that he put forward in the last sentence of paragraph 81 is no such authority. Um, so far as Lord Briggs's reference, a very generic reference to abusive process of paragraph 17 uh, of his judgment in Vedanta, we make four points about that passage. First, there is no suggestion anywhere in paragraph 17, or indeed anywhere else in the judgment in Vedanta, that Lord Briggs 
was referring to abuse of process alleged uh, to arise by reason of jurisdictional or forum non convenience <coughs> factors, including risk of irreconcilable judgments. Two, given the wide variety of circumstances that may give rise uh, to abuse of process, um, Lord Briggs's reference to abuse of process in paragraph 17 is perfectly capable uh, of being understood by reference to non-jurisdictional factors. For example, proceedings brought for a collateral purpose or which are vexatious in nature. Such an interpretation would make sense in the context of his simultaneous reference to striking out as disclosing no reasonable cause of action or seeking reverse summary judgment on the basis of absence of a tribal issue. Three, what Lord Briggs said at paragraph 17 must be read in the context of what preceded it at paragraph 16, which is very clear as to the, the, the um, uh, uh, nature of the right at Article 4, and what followed it at paragraph 39, where he um, uh, explained how the um, <coughs> in, ineluctable logic of a Rusu essentially creates formidable obstacles um, in co-defendant cases where uh, the co-defendant um, effectively gets dragged to um, the um, Article 4 um, uh, uh, jurisdiction um, uh, because of the power of the Article 4 right. Um, and four, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and the point we make about the passages of paragraph 16 and, and, and 39 is that they, they make it absolutely plain that the existence of a risk of irreconcilable judgments or, or indeed other uh, foreign non-convenience considerations do not provide any basis for precluding a claimant from pursuing a genuine claim against an English domicile defendant uh, or for accusing the claimant um, or indeed for that matter for, uh, for accusing the claimant of abusing EU law let alone abusing the process of the English court uh, and four had Lord Briggs considered that the risk of irreconcilable judgments and other non foreign non-convenience factors could themselves be relied upon as giving rise to an abusive process so as to justify striking out a claimant's claim. Despite the claimant's rights under Article 4, it's extremely surprising that he did not say so anywhere in his judgment. Particularly when what was at issue in, that, in, in his judgment was the outer limits of the Article 4 right. Um, I've so far approached the matter by reference to the claimant's right to sue BHBPLC uh, pursuant to Article 4. But the position in relation to BHP Limited is substantially similar in the sense that the appropriateness of BHP Limited being sued in England as opposed to somewhere else, or, or being sued at all, must again be resolved by reference to the relevant jurisdictional principles as developed in the Forum Non-Convenience Jurisprudence, not abuse of process principles. If it were otherwise, the long-established FNC jurisprudence would almost always be supplanted by a broad merits-based analysis of whether it is abusive for a claimant to be pursuing its claim in England as opposed to somewhere else. And that, that is simply, there's simply no authority or justification in principle for such an approach. <coughs> and furthermore, as we saw earlier, the, um, uh, the is, as is well known, the FNC jurisprudence is concerned with the grant of a stay in order to see whether the foreign court will accept jurisdiction to hear the case and whether the claimant can obtain effective justice in the foreign court. And if the abuse of process jurisdiction were engaged by foreign non-convenience factors, then those factors would result in the immediate strikeout of the proceedings, uh, thereby undermining the operation of the FNC jurisprudence, including the application of the second stage of the Spigliata test. Now, the, the respondent's general um, response to these considerations is that, well, since the question whether there is an abusive process requires a broad merits-based judgment, which takes account of all the facts of the case, they say, well, why can't we take into account facts that relate to jurisdiction? What's so special about those facts? Well, the fallacy in this reasoning is, is as follows. It wrongly assumes that the doctrine of abusive process 
extends to questions as to the appropriateness of England as the jurisdiction where the claim may be pursued. Whereas the doctrine is in fact concerned with whether on the assumption that England is the appropriate jurisdiction for <coughs> the claim, the pursuit of the claim is nevertheless, in the particular circumstances of the case, um, a misuse of the English court process. <clears throat> in other words, the logically prior question of the appropriateness of England as the jurisdiction of the claim is determined by reference to the jurisdictional rules and principles uh, as contained in the regulation and the FNC jurisprudence, the common law, not by reference to abuse principles. Um, and if the court were to decide that England is the appropriate jurisdiction um, uh, uh, in which the claims should be tried pursuant to the rules I've just referred to, the jurisdictional rules I've just referred to, it would be nonsensical for the court thereafter, having found that England is the appropriate jurisdiction, to strike the proceedings out on the basis uh, that they are abusive on, in reliance on the very facts <coughs> that were insufficient uh, to um, disqualify uh, the English court as an appropriate court for the trial of the claims. Now, just to be clear, I, 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 don't, um, I don't deny for a moment that the doctrine of abusive process may potentially be engaged where a claimant uh, 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 indulges in a multiplicity of proceedings well, that's why you're going to come to 84 of the judgment below. Uh, yes. 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 Um, okay. um, uh, uh, for example, as in the Henderson uh, form of abuse. But that form of abuse, however, is concerned with the unfair vexation or harassment of the <coughs> defendant, not the risk of irreconcilable judgments or foreign non convenience considerations per se. It's concerned with the conduct of the claimant rather than uh, with um, the uh, connections uh, 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 or absence of connections between the claims um, uh, and potentially competing jurisdictions. That brings me to my third overall topic, which is pointless, which is really where the battleground is, rather than um, uh, with respect to the, 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 the judge's reasoning below, uh, the, the question of pointless and wasteful litigation. Um, and my submissions here are under three headings. First, the centrality of the respondent's argument that the claimants can obtain full redress in Brazil. Second, the judge's approach to that. Sorry, we don't go too fast if he's the I'm so sorry, my lord. Um, so one is the centrality of the respondent's argument that the claimants can obtain full redress in Brazil. Second, um, the judge's approach and the flaws in that approach in relation to that issue. And third, the all-important question, whether it is clear and obvious, as is the standard on a strikeout application, whether it is clear and obvious that the claims are pointless and wasteful, and therefore an abusive process. Now, it's common ground between us that an arguable claim may constitute an abusive process where there is no real benefit to be gained by the claimant in pursuing it, and the costs of the litigation will be out of all proportion to what could potentially be gained by the claim. We accept that general principle in our skeleton, in our appeal skeleton at paragraph 67D. And there are indeed a few cases, a few examples of this kind of abuse, um, such as in Jamil, um, the libel case, and Wyeth, the drugs prescription case. Uh, in the present case, um, the respondent's re reliance on this form of abuse critically depends upon the proposition that the claimants are already able to obtain full redress in Brazil for the losses they've suffered. And they rely on three forms of redress. One is the Renova programs established under the TTAC. The second is the rough justice uh, scheme, um, the so-called novel system which has been developed by Judge Mario in the 12th Federal Court and is funded through Renova. And I will explain how the, those that developed through the various Renova programs. Um, and third, 
um, they say, as an alternative, if the first two are not good enough for the claimants, they say by, by the claimants resorting to legal proceedings, but legal proceedings only, on their case, against either Samarco or Renova. But they say, that's enough. You don't need to look for other defendants. You've got plenty of defendants. Here are, here are these two, uh, and you should, be, you should be content with that. Uh, and, and they say, that's, that's basically the, 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 the net that catches everything that falls by the wayside if Renova and Novel are not good enough. Now, um, <clears throat> and it's important as part of that case. No, I, I'm not under, uh, maybe I've forgotten. So really, they say legal proceedings against San Marco or Renova. Yes. Okay. Yes. They, yes, they do say Renova quite amazingly, but we'll, we'll come to the, uh, the, the sort of the reasoning that underlies the proposition that claimants, uh, that these claimants, uh, or indeed any victim of a collapse, may have a cause of action against Renova. Um, that's uh, that's to be explored in a moment. Um, but um, um, so so so, um, so, so it, it, and it, as part of that theory, they acknowledge and they maintain. They absolutely maintain that there's no question of any admission of liability by either Vale or BHP Brazil. Shareholders, uh, either the immediate shareholders uh, or above, that's a no-go area from their perspective. Obviously, from a commercial perspective, one understands that. There, there's no, there, there's no uh, admission of liability uh, or no acceptance of any obligation to provide full redress at the higher level <coughs> above the market. Um, now, so, so that's, that's basically their case uh, in relation to the, the available means of redress. Now, as you know, the, 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 although the respondents relied on that critically, that, that central pillar in support of their argument of pointless and wasteful litigation, the judge himself was felt unable to reach any conclusions about that. I don't need to go through the judgment again about that. But you may recall um, how he dealt with the matter at paragraphs 121 to 135. Although he made some observations uh, about certain aspects of Renova, um, he didn't draw any conclusions or make any definitive finding uh, as to whether the claimants would be able or were able to obtain full redress in Brazil. Uh, and this point, I think, was fairly identified in the Court of Appeals judgment, in the 5230 judgment, at paragraph 34. You may want to look at it very briefly. It's in bundle B. Um, at tab 11. Um, uh, and um, bundle, B, bundle B, tab 11, page 323. Uh, and in particular, first six, seven lines to the word, um, to the bracketed words, he repeated this at paragraph 140, C below. At paragraphs 121 to 133, under the heading full address, etc. And, and the, the court rightly points out that after the judge had uh, observed that um, this wasn't, he wasn't presiding over a trial, um, and that it would be inappropriate for him to attempt to adjudicate on the details of the issues arising, um, uh, the court finds uh, or observes that he does not, in fact, make any definitive or assessment of the risk that all or any of the claimants will not achieve full redress in Brazil. And he repeated this at paragraph 140. Uh, and, and that in is, is um, a fair reading of the judgment. Um, is, is, is full redress the right expression? I know it's been used a lot. But if it, if it were the case that a claimant could get better redress somewhere else than he could get in English proceedings, would that engage the Jamil Wyeth futility abuse jurisdiction? Potentially. Potentially. I can see that. And so is, is, is the question for the judge and for us whether can be said, whatever standard it might need to be said, uh, that they can't do any better here, the claimants can't do any better here. Well, even if it, there are deficiencies in redress in Brazil, so you couldn't properly describe it as full redress. That essentially, 
on my reading of the judgment. That essentially is what the judge found. Yes. He, he, his approach was basically, look, I don't know, essentially, putting it sort of somewhat bluntly. His final conclusion was, I don't know whether they can get full redress in Brazil. I'm not making any findings about that. I can't have a trial about that now. But what I, can, what, I am, what I am able to find and feel confident about saying is whatever they get in Brazil, they can't get, however inadequate it may be in Brazil, they can't do better in England. That, that is essentially what, what the conclusion came to. And you but see to answer that, my Lord's question, you're saying that is potentially a, a, an acceptable approach to, the, um, to this, this head of abuse. Theoretically, it could be, but but uh, 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 a simple example would be, and obviously there are there are issues as to how clear and obvious uh, is the position in Brazil, and how clear and obvious is the position in England. But if one were to take a simple example of a single claim, if it were absolutely clear that a claimant suing in Brazil could get a hundred dollars, uh, and a claimant suing in England. Uh, can get can only get eighty dollars for the sake of argument, and that was absolutely clear. There could be no argument about it. And for some obscure reason, the claimant wanted to sue in England for eighty dollars rather than suing his local court for a hundred dollars. Potentially, the court might say it is abusive. Potentially, but that of course, even that question would depend upon whether there are other reasons why. Uh, a claimant might wish to sue for eighty dollars. It could be, for example, because he or she can get some uh, non-monetary relief that might be of some advantage, or there could be uh, other reasons that might potentially explain his behaviour and make it reasonable. But what is striking in this case is that there is nowhere to be found in the judgment uh, any analysis of what it is the claimants could actually get money-wise. Because that's what it's. What, what is at stake here? What? Where is the analysis that uh, the judge makes um, by reference to evidence that the claimants could get X dollars realistically in Brazil, but they couldn't possibly get more than X? Uh, I'm well, sorry to interrupt you, but are, are we are we essentially therefore not arguing about any principle of law, the principle of law which you say the judge applied and you say. Is, is legitimate as a matter of law is to compare whether you get better, or whether the, whether there is a prospect of getting better yes. redress here than was available to claimants in Brazil. But you say the judge couldn't possibly, on the facts, reach that conclusion. Yes. So it's all about the evidence. Yes, it is about the evidence. Absolutely. And and, and our, our case is that the mantra, the mantra <coughs> of the respondents continually put forward that you, the claimants, can get full redress in Brazil is simply that. It's a mantra. It's a statement that they continually make without descending into the detail of the evidence. And I, I will take you through the evidence. So, so that in relation to each of the three means of redress that they rely upon to identify the multiple inadequacies. Now, and at the end of it, what you will find is this. I don't have to show to this court, that, uh, that my clients are right on every single inadequacy. It doesn't matter, ultimately. What matters, ultimately, in my respective submission, is that these claimants have genuine, legitimate, and substantially grounded concerns as to the amount of compensation they can get, either through Renova, or through the novel system, or through a multitude of local claims in state courts uh, and um, uh, small claims courts. They have genuine concerns. Concerns which the judge, in fact, accepted. Well, repeatedly, on at least two occasions, he said he accepted oh, on a few, On a few occasions, he did, yes. He, he did, he said well, um, I th when you say genuine concerns, do you mean genuine and reasonable concerns? I do say genuine and reasonable Well, concerns. OK, but they are quite different things. Yes. Well, they are. They are. Yeah, okay, they are. Which you, which you, surely genuine and reasonable is more important. Genuine, certainly, but reasonable is really what matters, isn't it? Well, I, I think both matter. Yeah. Both matter. I think that's the inherent in your genuine and legitimate yes, concerns. Yes, absolutely. You, you yes, accept, I, I wasn't trying accept, to say... I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But you accept that the, 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 there is an objective element to them. 
Yes, it's not but sufficient, that a... merely that they feel some concerns subjectively. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. I entirely agree as a matter of legal analysis. If the other side can prove uh, at the, uh, on a strikeout, evidential, the strikeout evidential standard, that it's clear and obvious, there is absolutely no point in c carrying on in England because everything we could possibly hope for in England is already available and waiting in Brazil. If they can show that, that would follow, it would follow from that, that whatever concerns we may have, even if genuinely felt, were completely rational, and therefore the court could take that into account. I accept that. Can, can I but, just, yes, sorry, sorry. No, no, you finish your point. But, but my, my position is simply this, when we go through this slightly elaborate process of looking at the evidence and what means of redress are, av are available, what you will find is there are serious grounds for concern, even if you don't agree with all of them, there, there is still a substantial number of grounds for concern. Uh, and once I get over that threshold, I don't have to persuade the court. And the court doesn't have to investigate or try to find on the balance of probabilities at this stage that each and every of those concerns is justified. Uh, I understand that. Can I just flag something for yes. that, that I'll be wanting to keep an eye on in your submissions on this and, and uh, those on the other side, which is whether one has to be careful to look at these claims claimant by claimant, category of claimant by claimant. So on the one hand, it's not sufficient for you to say, well, look, this is, this is a, a lacuna. Here's a, a legitimate ground of concern, and you can't knock that out, if that only applies to some of the claimants, not all of them. That's, that may be an answer for that category of claimant. Conversely, it may not be sufficient on the other side to say, well, look at the remedies that are available under the rough justice system, if there are some claimants for whom that is not a realistic or adequate remedy. So, uh, speaking I entirely for myself, um, I think I may need to be assisted as we go through just what categories of claimants the various arguments apply to, and it, it may cut both ways. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but there is an overarching point, uh, and I, I think I need to lay this out right now so you understand where I'm going. Even in relation to the means of redress that are available under Renova and the novel system, a critical feature, a critical feature of those systems or those means of redress is that they are optional. What I mean by that is by their own terms, those means of redress are not intended to preclude resort to court proceedings. Both means of redress recognize that any victim who is not satisfied with um, what is on offer has the choice to go to court. Well, I've been thinking about that. Let's assume this was all happening in this jurisdiction. So yes. Renova was a <coughs> industry-wide scheme of some sort, um, which offered a powerful form of mediation, which is really what I think on your analysis the PIM process is. Uh, would it not in some cases be appropriate to say, um, you cannot proceed with your court proceedings until you have been through that process. That's, after all, what's been done in the PPI context and probably other contexts as well. Um, so your point may be, I'm not expressing a view, um, an important point in terms of uh, a reason why you can't possibly strike someone out for not going down that route might not be a reason why you shouldn't stay them for not going down that route. That, that, that is a fair point. That's potentially uh, a, a possibility. But we need to be very clear about uh, the cases, for example, where this has happened. I think uh, the Andrew case. Uh, it's one of the PPI the Andrew, ones. Andrew and, and, uh, uh, and Barclays Bank case is one such example where Mr. Justice Waxman essentially stayed a claim for eight weeks to allow the claimant to file a claim under the scheme uh, and then uh, 
could proceed with a claim either if his claim was rejected under the scheme, uh, or alternatively, he didn't get an answer because obviously the scheme. Yes, was, yes, I, well, so, I remember that. So, in case that. management stay theoretically uh, uh, could um, could be something that um, that may play a part. But of course, that also then depends upon what potentially is on offer under the scheme. Um, if the scheme uh, is limited in its scope, or it provides uh, 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 standardised damages only. So if you are if you are a, if you are a washerwoman, you get X, and that's it. Uh, uh, there is a fundamental question as to whether it's the job, it's the court's job to say, well, hold on a minute, you sh you should accept X. Why don't you accept X? Well, I mean, we we're getting ahead of yourself. I was really. Uh, I, I, Implicit, my answer was, for the time being, I accept all that. But in terms of a stay, yes. it might be right to say, well, of course you've got the right to reject this process, the result of this process, but you must go through it first. That, that, that's conceivable. But if, but if, the, but if the scheme itself <laughs> uh, is entirely optional, well, and you know... Yeah, I, 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 it, yes, it, it's, it, the scheme itself says you don't have to accept what we offer. You can go to court, number one. And if you know that what is on offer is basically standardized, rough justice, as it's called, and you don't want it, you want to take your chances in court, it would be a very strong thing in my respectful submission. Well, it, it's simply off scale in my respectful submission to strike out the claim as being a, an abuse of the process of the court. Theoretically, you might say, well, hold on a minute, you should really think long and hard about this. Uh, and obviously, I'll come back to that in the context of, of the case management state. But this is not the kind of case where a scheme has uh, come up yeah. recently. Uh, it, it, it offers some, it, it has some attractions, uh, and claimants are being hasty in, 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 in saying, well, it, it's not good enough for us. We want to pursue our claim in court. Uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a case where. The scheme, the Renova, when it was set up, gave some fairly basic compensation, which some people took, because that's, that, that was what was on offer. That's all they could get. Emergency relief in relation to water interruption or things of that kind. You've lost everything as a result of the catastrophe, and you're offered the, the, a means to get a few hundred dollars. What are you going to say? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and, that, and, and in those days, there, was no, there were no releases that were, that were required by Renova. What happened over time, and has now been formalized through the novel system is, Judge Mario has said whilst administering the various programs and dis disputes under those programs is, well, now we're formalizing it, uh, we, we've got a structure and we've got a damages matrix. If, you, if you're going to accept X, what you can't do is take X and then behind everybody's back, try and somewhere else. Fair enough. Uh, and, and, and releases have, have come into play. But that, that, that's, that raises obviously different questions. I'm dealing with the because obviously, and to go back to, to Lord Justice Popplewell's point, yes, there may be a different analysis to be applied in relation to those claimants who at some point have claimed under the novel system uh, and have signed a release. I quite see that, and I'll come to how we can deal with that. But, um, but, but, um, but, but merely because there is in existence a means of redress, which is optional. Uh, uh, is prima facie an unpromising start as a ground for striking out uh, or, uh, 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 as um, uh, uh, abusive process. Having taken you off your course slightly, can I just clarify something I'm pretty sure about, but it's relevant to this area, we might just get out of the way now. One thing that is not open to you to say is that in a court process in Brazil, I might get X pounds or reals for a particular head of damage, but that in an English court, I might get 2X, because an English court would have to apply Brazilian law about what the level of damages was for that same relief for that same head of, head of loss. Uh, and conceptually, although life is what it is, almost certainly not in practice, you would get exactly the same amount for exactly the same loss in an English court 
as you would in a Brazilian court. I think all that is obvious, but I want to make sure it's not part of your case that it's legitimate for you to go on because you have a feel that English court will be more generous. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I accept that. I no, accept good. That. I, I, I thought you would. I accept that. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, and the, the bottom line in relation to why, it's, again, just to kind of give you the heads up as to where I'm going, although I'm sure you know where I'm going because you've read this cousin arguments. But, but the, the basic problem about limiting us to Samarco is that Samarco is essentially a bankrupt company. Um, uh, uh, and um, it is. It has. Um, uh, by bankrupt, I mean. Forgive me. Uh, that's perhaps putting it too high. It, it's in a process of judicial reorganisation, whereby it's uh, seeking um, uh, effectively. It's asking its creditors to accept a ninety-five percent haircut uh, of their of their rights of their uh, um, uh, claims against the company uh, in order to survive. Uh, as a as a as a going concern, and to be able to meet uh, claims uh, that are related to the collapse. Well, is, is the solvency uh, point open to you? I, I, well, that, I, I have thought that was the, the problem you had in, in the evidence being disallowed and not getting permission to appeal on it. Well, I I I, I do rely on the judicial reorganisation of the market. But that's happened subsequently. That's happened subsequently, hasn't it? Absolutely, which which happened, which has happened only recently. Yes, it happened. It began April of last year, um, which obviously was. But it's um, not one of the grounds of appeal, is it? Um, it's um, it, but it's relevant. It, that that aspect is relevant to the other side's case that the claimants can get full redress in Brazil, in, including by suing in court, but only some other. Wouldn't it have to be a separately pleaded ground of appeal? Relying on fresh evidence and subsequent. In well, we have applied to rely on the fresh evidence. I have not And and. But, wait, but is there a ground? I mean, solvency is an obvious candidate for for, for, for suing different defendants here uh, and supporting it by an argument that uh, whatever the, the redress available against other defendants <coughs> uh, abroad, there's a solvency risk. We may not actually be able to get the money. However pure the, the the rights are, yes. But I haven't detected that in any of your grounds of appeal. Is, well, it, is it there? It's covered by the ground that says the judge was wrong uh, to um, to find that there was um, nothing to be gained by um, suing in England. You have to say it. why he was wrong. No, it doesn't say precisely why. No, but you wrong. have to say that's my, that's the problem, isn't it? Well, I I, I I don't accept that because it's tied up with the question whether the, the litigation, the claims, amount of pointless and wasteful litigation. This is difficult for you because we remind ourselves, don't we, this was a pleaded ground, it was then expressly abandoned. Mr Hollander then sought to revive it in closing submissions. That yes. led to all sorts and a stinging judgment saying this wasn't going to be allowed to run. Yes. So it's against that backdrop that you have to seek to revive on appeal um, with fresh evidence, a brand new, and as my Lord, Lord Justice Popwell says, obvious line of argument if it's going to be pursued. There is a tricky procedural background for you, isn't it? There, there, it's it's slightly tricky, but but, <laughs> but I, it's very, perhaps it's very tricky. I, it doesn't matter what, what how you want to, uh, what adjective you want to use uh, to qualify it. Mm. But the, but the, I will come to that, and obviously. Well, um, I mean, I, there may be a risk here. You've been normally so far. You've been very highly structured, and that's on the whole yes, helpful. Absolutely. But you are beginning just to throw in points. I mean, the solvency point came out from nowhere. It did. I mean. Well, but uh, well, the, the solvency point is, and, and is, is is part and parcel of our response, part and parcel of our response to their additional ground. The judge was unable. No, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get a structure. I got, yes. so, well, you, you were the first one is the centrality of the respondent's argument. The second yes. is the judge's approach. The third is it clear and obvious that claims are pointless and wasteful. I haven't actually got to any of those things so far. No, but well, let, let me let me perhaps I can I can get to. to the, but uh, were you planning to make the solvency point yes. now at this stage? No, no. Well, no. let's get to it when we come to it, and then we can see how it fits in. <laughs> well, I'm, I think I'm perhaps too anxious to answer your questions immediately. I should probably well, that's say, a good well, thing. I'll come to those. Well, I don't discourage you from answering our questions, but I don't <laughs> think it really was an answer to any of our questions. It was just something you were longing to say. But um, anyway, you'll come right. come to it when you were going to, and then we'll have this debate again. Yes. Uh, just, uh, just before you do, just give me the reference to which, uh, which ground of appeal yeah, you say covers it. Right. You didn't take me to it, but and, and do it in due course. Yeah. But 
I'll, I'll, we'll do that. I, I, don't, I don't want to lose sight of that. Um, the um, so so, but, but but I think the point where we had um, perhaps slightly digressed was um, where I was saying that when you read paragraphs one two two to one four two of the judgment, what you find is that essentially the judge was saying whatever problems there may be with the claimant's ability to obtain redress in Brazil, he was satisfied that the claimants would not be able to do better through the English proceedings. That's the bottom line. Uh, and we say that if this was a conclusion about the absolute value of the claimant's claims, then it was plainly unsustainable uh, because the sheer number of claimants and the magnitude of their losses in the light of the enormity of uh, the disaster means that the aggregate damages would likely run into billions, which the judge himself fairly accepted in his judgment in relation to costs. And you can only, you, you only have to do the maths. Uh, but I'm sorry to interrupt you again so soon after you've been released from the <laughs> barrage. But why are we looking at it globally? Don't we have to look at it claimant by claimant? If, it's, if, if, if a, a, an unlicensed fisherman has a claim for which he can't get adequate redress, then uh, it's not abusive for him. It may be abusive for everybody else, and his claim's only worth tuppence halfpenny. Yes. But wh wh why are we lumping all the claimants together? Well, uh, of this submission. We we don't we we don't I I, I I am putting it, I'm only putting it this way because I, it's not clear what the judge meant by whatever whatever they can do in Brazil they whatever they can get in Brazil they won't be able to get better in England he didn't say for example I find as a fact that a fisherman can only get ten thousand two thousand dollars in Brazil but he couldn't get more in England there's no evidence there was no evidence about it. there was no quantum uh, evidence at all about the worth of any particular claimant's claims in Brazil compared to England. So there was no comparison made of any sort, of, of this sort, by the judge. It wasn't even attempted by either side. So how therefore, one asks, how therefore can the judge say, whatever problems you can find in Brazil, I find that it's clear and obvious on a strikeout that you're not going to be able to do better in England. How? Well, it Why seems to me that he seems to have been thinking because of the cross-contamination, sort of, somehow the proceedings would never get to a judgment here because they would be so interrupted, distracted. Um, <coughs> that's the that's point. What, that's what I... That's the point. And there's a powerful indicia of that, for example, at paragraph 135, mm. subparagraph 2 of his judgment. His essential reasoning for finding the claimants are not going to be able to do better in England is because he thought the claims in England were basically irredeemably, irredeemably unmanageable. It's, it's completely and he exciting. comes back to that point, that central point that he, he, was, he found persuasive, that the whole thing is unmanageable in England and therefore that's why you'll never be able to do better in England. Because you'll, never get, that. you'll never get to a judgment in England. Is you'll, what really you'll never get to a judgment uh, in England or you, you'll... you'll or, Conceivably, I suppose he was saying, you'll never get to a judgment that's going to be any better than what you can get in Brazil. But he never actually addressed the question. Well, that's a very important distinction. That's not going back on the very distinction which my lady has rightly put to you. It's, but his basic point was, this is how I've all understood it, he's saying you can't do better here because these proceedings will just run into the sand and you'll never get anything. It'll be a barbecued feast. Yes. Um, he's not saying... Um, and anyway, anything you do get won't be any better than you get in Brazil, because that's a quite different exercise. Exactly. And, and so my, my point is therefore simply, if, if all he's saying is the proceedings are unmanageable in England, I've already addressed that, uh, and he's not really, on the face of it, saying anything more than that. The exception would be the 30% comments. Yes. So that would be the, the one area of comparison where he'd say, and what's and another reason why you won't do so well here is you've you're got You're quite to right. He did make the 30% And comment. in Brazil, you can get legal aid. But, but, but again, how does one begin to make a comparison about that? Yeah. Uh, if, if the damages matrix that's available under the novel system uh, is, uh, is based on a, on a least common denominator for the various categories of victims, uh, but uh, a, a particular claimant happens to, to be quite far above the damages matrix because of his or her particular circumstances, then even a substantial uh, contingency fee 
might still mean that that, defendant, uh, that, that claimant is still, would still be better off uh, seeking his or her rights um, uh, in um, uh, pursuant to uh, an individual court claim. The 30%, the, the I think, was expressed to be up to 30%. It's up to, it's not both, even. Both, both, exactly, in, exactly, both, yeah. both in the evidence and, and faithfully in the judgment. Yes. Uh, and that was the defendant's evidence doing the best they could out of the public statements that had been made at yes. about it. But yes. was there any evidence on your side which clarified? I don't believe what, that, what, what it amounted to. No, there, there, there was no detailed evidence of the, um, the, the contingency, fee, contingency fee arrangements. When you say detailed, was there any evidence from your side? I don't think that there was. No, but there was the evidence. Well, I'm told there is some evidence that some some categories or types of claim were up to 30, others were uh, lower thresholds. Um, so there was some evidence about it. I don't know where it is. Uh, well, you'll, you'll, give us the, you'll, you'll give us the references in due course. Well, if Thank you'd you. like the references, we can find them and uh, we can... Uh, but in truth, my, sorry, I didn't yeah. interrupt. Can you give me the we, I think we addressed to some extent the, the comparative advantages uh, uh, of, um, of individual claimants um, being, being enabled uh, uh, to bring their claims through contingency arrangements and so on. Uh, you'll see that in... Um, in our first uh, skeleton argument, first instance skeleton, the paragraphs 464 uh, to, um, to 466, which identify the re 466 in particular, which identify this is bundle um, D. bundle D, tab 10, page 434. What will we see if we look there? What's in so, so you will see the, compa the, the comparative advantages. Um, of bringing... Um, so does that include evidence about... I thought we were, you were asking about where you had evidence about contingency fee arrangements. Yes, I'm afraid... I'm sorry. It, this is not specifically about the contingency oh, I see. fee arrangements. Okay. I will give you a separate reference for that. Yes, I see. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Um, if you want to come, we frequently ask questions and your solicitors ask questions. Okay, well... Um, so... Uh, I will try and get the references, the, the actual references to, to the evidence, um, so far as they exist. So, so, but, but yes. So, so, the, the, but the basic point is how, how, where is the exercise that the judge performed in that respect? Uh, where is the comparative exercise? The answer there is none, and the uh, and and it's impossible to perform. It's simply impossible um, because we don't have sufficient information about the value of each claimant's claim. Uh, and um, so, so striking out on that basis is simply not possible in my respectful submission. So, um, I mean, I, I don't have time to take you through individual loss schedules, for example, that are at the, at the back of bundle B. But if, if I can simply, if you flick through, there are all kinds of heads of loss. There are very significant losses. Uh, uh, that have been. Um, well, can we just look at them? Because well, I, I, let, let's look at a couple of them. So, bundle B, for example, tab 19. So, this is one of the municipality claims. Yes. And, and it's common ground, is it, that, the, that, that their claims, as pleaded, so to speak, are in the hundreds of millions? Uh, well, to, the most in aggregate, in aggregate, the, in yeah, aggregate. the 58 or the, the 25, yes. Yeah. But a lot, I mean, the, the municipality claims in particular, it's not common ground. No, quite a lot is going to be uh, mitigated to a very considerable extent by the non-pecuniary relief granted via Renova, i.e. they will rebuild the knockdown walls and the... Um, well, certainly some of it. I mean, you yeah. say you say quite a lot of it. I mean, okay, obviously I that's putting a. You could be right. I I don't know. Yes, I see. Okay. I, um, but but I mean, we got to keep our eye here on what will ultimately be money claims. 
Uh, absolutely, we, we do. And, and we also have to keep in mind that we are on a strikeout application and we're trying to sort of supposedly guess where one can do better, whether in Brazil or England. Um, but um, if, uh, if you look, for example, at page 514, only a couple of the heads of losses uh, at 2.2.2, um, you can see a figure of 5.3 million um, British uh, uh, rares, um, which I think amounts to about 1.1 um, million dollars. Um, he did, I mean, there are all the smaller figures. Most of it is not quantified because those were prepared some time ago, but there are substantial figures referred to where there are heads of loss pleaded. If you go to the next one, perhaps to give some more detail, uh, the municipality of uh, Rio Dochi, um, page um, 520. You can see the kinds of losses that are identified. Um, Could I just ask, in the Stellison argument, it says at paragraph 21, in addition, a selection of additional particulars from each category of claimant will be made available. There's no cross-reference to anything. But is th this is what... I think, the, yes, this. exactly. These are the samples. Of both yeah, okay, that's, I, that's what I guessed. Thank you. Um, selected. And, um, and you can see, for example, at the top of page 523, uh, this is the entire um, destruction of um, a particular project, um, which is quantified, at, in my calculation, about $400,000. But yes, there are. There is no quantification of every single head of claim. Um, if you go to um, page um, five thirty, which is uh, the Archdiocese of Mariana, you can see um, destruction of the buildings at fifteen point nine, nearly fifteen point nine million. Uh, in ten point one. 9.9 million, 840,000 uh, in 10.2 and 818,000 in 10.3. I'm sorry, it's me who said perhaps we should just look at them. But um, what, it, what 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 is what are the points you're what is going to? The, the point is simply that there are very substantial heads of losses yeah. uh, that have been suffered. Uh, by um, the um, various categories of claimants, um, including um, uh, the individuals as well. And I'll show you uh, an example. Um, but you will see, for ex uh, it, uh, just before we move on to the individuals, the utility company uh, is at tab 22. And you can see some significant losses identified. In uh, 36, 37, um, 37. <clears throat> go to tab 25. This is an educational institution, foundation, Mariana. You, you go to um, page 575. Claimant expects to recover losses to date of more than 20 million, which I think is about. Four million dollars. I, I had in mind the figures that Mr. Michael has in his fifth witness statement, a paragraph thirty-five, where there's an analysis of what the quantum is of some of some of the, of some of the claims. Yes. And they include, for example, two hundred and fifty-three point nine million of those claiming the loss of income other than through fishing, two hundred and thirty-five million pounds equivalent for those relation to fishing losses, uh, 3 million for psychological injury, 5 million for physical injuries, and so on and so on and so forth. Yes. So that, that at least gives one an, an idea of, of, an of idea magnitude. Of, of, of their analysis yes. of the quantum that your clients are putting on their claims, so yes. whether, whether valid or not. Yes. Well, that, that, that's, that's what they say. What, what we also know is in the MPF proceedings in the 155 CPA, the MPF's 
prima facie evaluation of the damage is $43.8 billion. That's why it's called 155 CPA. One fi 155 billion British, um, pretty much Brazilian uh, uh, hands. Uh, and uh, in fact, you, you will see that uh, on, um, in, um, in bundle F, page tab 16. page Respondents, uh, no doubt, dispute the, the accuracy of the total damage estimate. But uh, again, one is, how does one, how, what is one supposed to do with this uh, in on a strike out application? How can the court even begin to enter into an analysis of that? Um, uh, uh, and, and so it, 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 it's just not uh, an aspect of the evidence that could form the basis of. Uh, any safe comparison between what might be obtained in Brazil uh, and um, what might be obtained in England, or, or, or indeed of the overall worth of the claims. Uh, and, and it does really boil down, and the judge, you might say, did it. It's the only way he could have done it on a strikeout. That's really the bottom line. He did it in the only way he could, he could have done it to strike it out. And that is to say, well, I didn't really need to do any of this because the claims are irredeemably unmanageable, and if that's right, then that means that really you haven't got a hope in hell of doing better in England compared to Brazil, and the rest is just of interest, and I'll make some observations about what's happening in Brazil, and that's it. And, and that is fundamentally an, an, an inappropriate way to deal with the striking out on what is on any view arguable <coughs> claims and on any view valuable claims. It's such a superficial way of dealing with the matter it's almost an affront to justice. Um, uh, and, um, and so, but, but let's look um, for a moment at the means of redress uh, on the basis that it might be said that um, we're being irrational in, as it were, turning our noses up to Renova and what's on offer through novel uh, and not being content to sue Samarco uh, only in Brazil. Um, so, um, the, the, the TTAC, you know, uh, sets out effectively the scene in relation to Renova, and I think we could probably uh, we, can, we could probably look at that and flick through um, fairly swiftly. Um, uh, and um, you will find the TTAC in bundle <coughs> E, tab 15. Parties to the TTAC are identified on page 550, a variety of um, uh, uh, public authorities, the federal government and various state governments and uh, various other institu public institutions. Um, the agreement made clear there was no admission of liability by the Brazilian companies for the collapse. And you see that on page 665 at um, clause 256. Um, and this was against the background of the companies all having served defences in the 20 billion CPA, denying liability in respect of the relief claimed. Um, and you will see from clause 2 on page 561, and in fact, you can see the same non-admission of the liability on page 552, first recital on that page.
Um, and uh, the essential purpose of the agreement, as recorded uh, in uh, Clause 2, on page um, 561, was to set forth programs to be designed, developed, and implemented by the Foundation, later called RENOVA, in order to restore the environment and the socio-economic conditions of the coverage area impacted by the event, considering the previous situation and the adoption of the necessary mitigation, compensation, and indemnity measures provided for the programs, etc. Um, uh, and, um, and that's supplemented in clause 5 on page 562, um, which dealt with the development, approval, and implementation of the programs. Um, and um, uh, one of the programs was for the compensation and indemnification of the impacted persons, which its common ground uh, extended extends only to individuals and small and micro businesses. And you see that in clause eight on page five seventy three. Clause eight starts the thematic axis. Um, at the origin of the language of priority axes um, that we see later developing in the context of arguments about what program should, should or shouldn't contain. Thematic axes and respective socioeconomic programs to be prepared, developed, and implemented by the foundation to be organized, which are detailed in a separate chapter, are the following. And then you can see B's program for compensation and indemnification of the impacted. Um, uh, 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 and um, but, but large businesses, and, and, um, including that of the 58 claimants. Um, Sorry, I've got lost. Um, clause 08, thematic axes. Yes. Where did you go after that? And then, if you, in fact, if you go to clause 10, uh, me, um, page 575, uh, uh, you will see. It identifies provision of pecuniary compensation in Roman II in a single installment, repair in monetary form, paying in, in a lump sum on an individual basis or family unit, paid to individuals or legal entities, in the latter case only to micro enterprises and small sized companies. And similarly, there could be pecuniary compensation for installments. And, and uh, there is, uh, just to give you the reference, Professor Rosa, paragraph 306, gives the thresholds for small, um, micro, um, uh, and above. And essentially, micro businesses um, uh, had a threshold of 360,000 uh, British uh, hairs. And, um, and, um, and that's And, and uh, small, uh, forgive me, and, and uh, small businesses have a threshold uh, of um, 4.8 million uh, British um, pounds. Um, and um, the process. Well, well, I'm sorry. Well, well, while we're on the 58, um, I think the rival evidence isn't. Ad item for, for all of them as a single <coughs> category. Um, I think I'm right in saying that uh, Professor Didier agrees that the larger businesses, I mean, there were 13 or 23 of them. Uh, 50, 58. No, 13. No, I'm sorry, no, the, the, large, businesses. the larger yes. businesses. Yes, sorry. 13 of them yes. do fall outside the category and uh, that they can't be the subject of a generic sentence in the. 155 billion CPA. Yes. But in relation to the other categories that make up the 58, uh, municipalities, church based utilities, I'm not sure that, the, that Professor Rosa and Professor Didier do agree. And speaking for myself, I would be very much assisted just by a list of the references by, by, for each of those subcategories. To what they say about their, okay. uh, their their ability to come within TTAC, GTAC, and which may not be the same question, their ability to benefit from the raised judicata effect of a 
generic sentence in the 155 billion CPA. Yes. Could, could I just ask that to go on somebody's list to give me to give me those references? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, um, and 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 there's there's also there's, there's also an issue, for example, as to whether the TTAP covers, for example, extraordinary expenses for municipalities, which is another sort of slightly. Yes, indirectly affected losses is another one I'd like to have on my list, please, of the, of the rival references. Yes, um, Professor, yes. I picked up some, certainly, Professor Rose and Professor Didier, but I may have missed some, and if there's, if there's some elsewhere, I'd be grateful for them. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, and, um, and you will see that the process of recovery of compensation pursuant to the program is characterized as a negotiation pro process in Clause 10, um, paragraph. Roman two in particular, it refers to the coordinated negotiation program, and um, um, and that is then um, described in a few more clauses that I'll come to in a moment. Um, but um, but because it's a negotiation program, participation in the program is expressly provided in clause thirty four. That's page five eight five to be optional. So that's clause thirty four, paragraph one. Well, 34, first paragraph, you can see it says, the foundation shall create indemnification parameters considering the socioeconomic condition of the impacted parties in their previous situation, etc. So, so basically, RENOVA itself defines the what the indemnification parameters will be. Um, and then um, registration in the coordinated negotiation program by the impacted is tackled. Uh, and, that, and that's why the judge noted at paragraph 134, Roman 7 of his judgment, that any claimant dissatisfied with an offer of compensation uh, made by Renova is free to pursue the alternative. Sorry, is that, that's what facultative means. Is it? It's not a phrase I've come up with. Word I'd... It's, it's op in other words, it's optional. Yep. Yes. Um, and, um, and, and clause. Um... Well, it's not quite the same thing. I see. It literally just means it's optional. Okay. Yes. Used in the insurance sense. It's a, it's, yes. Sorry, I should have picked it up. Uh, uh, and, um, and and you can see that um, <clears throat> that the same point is reflected in clause thirty six, for instance, five eight six. Um, the impacted who, by the end of the negotiations, do not accept the terms of the agreement presented under the coordinated negotiation program may claim a potential compensation on their own, but they cannot be excluded from other socio-economic programs as the exclusive result of such rejection. So that reinforces the facultative aspect of participation in the program. Um, and there are, there are detailed uh, requirements for registration, which um, in clause 21, pages 581 and 82, um, which Professor Rosa describes as in practice likely to provide a significant obstacle to registration for many Brazilians, particularly those who are economically disadvantaged. This is Rosa 1, paragraph 312. So sorry, which, which clause are we referring clause, to? Clause 21. Page 581. Page 581. The TTAG does not contain any mechanism enabling an impacted person to appeal against a decision uh, of Renova in relation to that person's claim. Uh, and as we saw in clause 36, persons who, are, who, who participate but are disappointed by the offer are left to pursue their claims in court. So, so the, 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 and, and, and that obviously is, a, is a, an important feature, we say the purely optional feature of the compensation program is highly relevant to the question whether the claimant's claims should be seen as uh, abusive by reason of the existence of the program. Um, now, uh, there are 
definitions of impacted persons, uh, which you will find on page 556. Um, and um, the impacted in Roman 2 are described as individuals or legal entities and their respective communities which have been directly affected by the event. This therefore excludes from Renova's compensation program those who have been indirectly affected by the collapse, even though they may have claims for indirect or consequential loss. I'm afraid I've got Professor Rose's uh, references for that, um, but we'll supplement that with Professor Didier. So I, for, yes. for, for the sake of being Professor as Didier, as possible, I won't give any references for the moment. I think so Professor Didier says, yes, that's what it says, but there aren't any dam-related types of loss that would fall outside that category. Yeah, well, which, uh, as, a matter of, um, um, as, a, as a matter of language, seems somewhat difficult uh, to follow um, uh, on the basis that the language uses is directly affected yes. and that there is a separate definition of indirectly impacted in sub 3 on page 557. Yes, but... Yeah. We're not looking at this as English lawyers as a matter of language. We're, we're dealing with concepts of recoverability of damage under Brazilian law. Well, we are, but, I, there's, I, 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 there's a, but there's a disagreement about that. There is, and there, there are quite a number of references, I think, I've come across, uh, not all of which I've noted. So um, I'd, I'd be grateful for them, for them all. Absolutely. Well, uh, as I say, I, I, we, will, we will give you a complete list of, of those. Uh, but certainly the question of direct and indirect is, a, is, a, is an issue in dispute. Uh, and and, uh, and Professor Rosa points not only to the directly affected language, but also the definition of indirectly impacted on page 557, which contemplates that indirectly impacted uh, persons only have a right to uh, access information. Um, but this is this is an example of a point, which which will probably only apply to some claimants and not others. Uh, the claimant only has directly affected losses. It's no good saying, oh, well, TTAC excludes indirectly affected losses. That's completely irrelevant to their claims. Well, I agree. I agree. But it's also a case of looking at all of the objections in their totality. Because if, if, if all of the objections looked at in toto would apply to all of the claims, and the court is unable on a strikeout basis to conduct a mini trial and decide Professor Didier is right on this one, but Professor Rosa is right on that other one, then the position that you find yourself in realistically is, well, so there's a lot to argue about, but really, we can't determine on paper. I understand that, but I don't think you're attempting to show me as we go along that if this particular point only applies to some claims, by the time you get to the end, all the points, if you, or, or at least one of the points, will apply to all the claims. Well, but, I um, that, that's what you'd have to do to say you can't strike out anyone. Unless you, unless you say, never mind for the moment, a claimant by claimant approach. What's happened in this case is there's an application to strike out everyone. That can't be justified, and there may be particular claimants for whom the better redress argument is a is a good argument. But we should wait and see, and abuse should still be available in relation to them when we've drilled down a bit more closely into their individual claims. See, that might be an argument. Well, I, advance, but I'm, I'm less attracted by an argument that here are a whole series of difficulties, uh, none of which apply to everybody. Uh, and then when we get to the end, uh, nobody can be struck out for abuse, and that's the end of it. Th that, that is true. But I, 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 I do obviously rely on, on the fact, on the, on, on the first point that you made, which is that, um, um, uh, uh, it's, that, that it's simply impossible. Mm on the state of the evidence and on the basis of the shape of the argument for the court to be able to say, well, for this claimant, there is absolutely no possibility of any concern whatsoever on, on any ground. It's not possible. But you appreciate that we've got, sorry to interrupt you. But I'm so sorry. We've got to deal with this application. But in the course of doing so, it may be helpful 
the extent that we feel secure about doing so, if we make observations about the extent to which some of the issues raised at this stage may be appropriate to raise, be raised later. Of course. And exactly. that's really, couldn't speak for my yes. lord, no, but I, that's, I, that, I, I think you're going to keep your eye on that ball and, uh, as well and be prepared to address us about that possible outcome. Yes, I, I, I quite accept that, and, and I think that that point becomes more evident in relation to, for example, collateral attack and so on. But, 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 but I, 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 I think all, 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 I, all I can say at this stage is I'm just taking you through the TTAC and I'm identifying limiting features, if I can put it that way. I'm not saying that every single limiting feature that, I'm, that I am identifying applies universally to each and every claimant. I accept that uh, uh, some features will apply to some, uh, others uh, will not apply, uh, but, but, but not to others. But the, but the sum total of my submissions is that when you look at the totality of the limiting features that I'm going through at the moment, one or more of them will likely apply to the, the totality of the claimants. One or more of them. For example, obviously we know that the, the purely optional nature of the program and the fact that you're permitted to sue, if that's what you want to do and you want more, basically, you're not satisfied with the offer, that is a point that applies to all of the individuals and the micro and small businesses. Well, it may apply to them all, but it doesn't mean that any individual claimant isn't getting adequate redress in Brazil if, as it so happens, he couldn't possibly prove that he's suffered greater loss than he'd get in the matrix. That, 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 that is, I, I accept that. It's not, it's not valid to say, well, there's my one point, it applies to everybody. If that's good enough. It applies to everybody at this stage. It applies to everybody at this point. stage because nobody is in a position, nobody has tried to suggest or prove at this stage that any particular individual or any particular micro or small business cannot possibly get more than what is available under Renova or under the novel system. They've not tried that. All that they said is, look, look at all what we have on offer. That's full redress. So, so in other words, whereas you, you are rightly pointing out the danger in my submissions effectively uh, being generic in nature, they go the other way. They're entirely generic the other way. Yes, I understand that. Uh, this and, is uh, a point for both of you to grapple with. Yes, well, <laughs> I, I'm pushing back a little bit, but simply because... My, my object, my, my, the only thing that I have to do, I don't have to predict every other permutation of, sub, uh, of an, a subset of an abusive process argument that they may wish to run later in relation to Mr. X or Mr. Mrs. Y or particular groups and so on. I just can't because I don't know what it is. I, I don't have a target. I can't address that now. So, 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 so are you content for the court to deal with it? on the basis, if this were the view the court took, that it can't say now that there's an abuse, but that all arguments on abuse can be raised again at a later stage. As, yes, that, that's con conceivable. Uh, de obviously, depending upon the, the ground of abuse that we are talking about, um, it, it may, uh, if you're saying, um, pointless and wasteful as the relevant head of abuse, just thinking aloud, I suppose conceivably uh, that ground of abuse might, might apply to every single claimant, conceivably, I suppose. If one were to take every single claimant's position individually and one were able to show objectively on a clear and obvious basis uh, that there is absolutely no chance that uh, any of them supported by evidence, uh, 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 quantum evidence and, and accounting evidence, that this is what they would get under Renova or under the no novel system, uh, and, 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 and they couldn't possibly get more uh, yes, that, that, might not, that might not even be true of some of the 58, say the 13 large businesses. They might, they, they might form a separate category, but, uh, but some subject to Well, that. you're being very generous in saying well, this. Who knows? Uh, I, I don't know. Well, because for them, uh, their only remedy is to sue in the local courts, as I understand it, that being common ground. Yes. Oh. Experts, and, and therefore, 
the evidence about the the difficulties about that yes might that's be sufficient true. to say well that's it's never an abuse for them to come here it, it may not it may not but but um but but, but subject to that you, you i have your answer thank you yes uh, yes i i can't of course i i can't i can't stop the other side from mounting an entirely uh, a, a much more laser-like case focusing on the position of individual defendants and demonstrating I think, uh, we've, I think, we've, I think we've got yeah. yes thank you I think we've got I'm sorry. We, we, yeah so um uh, i think i can probably <clears throat> just take you through the rest of the points more quickly um you will see uh, i'm sure you will have seen the various provisions already but um there's an issue about um even types of loss that may or may not be recoverable perhaps we'll add that to our little list of Professor Rosa and Professor Didier's disagreements. Yes, uh, please. Um, and um, you will see that in clause, um, clause 187 on page 637 um, provides for Renova to determine the budget, the targets, and the schedule for each program. So they call the shots, basically. And um, clause 209 on page 645 uh, deals with the establishment of the foundation and how it's going to be responsible to manage all the programs. Um, and you will see in paragraph 3 on page 645, it's exclusively responsible for managing the funds provided by the founding companies in compliance with this agreement. So where are you reading from? Uh, page 645, clause 209, paragraph 3. <clears throat> and, um, and then if you look at page 646, um, clause 211, foundation, uh, you have a board of governors and executive office um, and a few other internal organs. Um, and um, if you look at... Um, Clause 213 over the page, 647. Board of Governors um, shall be composed of seven members, of which two members shall be appointed by each founding company and one private representative appointed by the Interfederative Committee. So, in other words, Samarco, Vale, and BH Brazil appoint six members uh, and control the Board of Governors. Um, and uh, paragraph two says that the board takes its decisions by at least five votes of its members. And there are various funding limits that are applied uh, to Renova, and you see that starting on page 643. <coughs> um, if you look at page, uh, sorry, clause 203, um, paragraph 2, it talks of the review of reparatory measures is not subject to any ceiling and should be established in the amount required to fully repair the described socio environmental and socio economic damages according to the principles and other clauses in this agreement. So there's no preset limit on the amount that Renova, in theory, may devote to the cost of reparatory programs. Um, uh, but the position as regards compensatory programs is different. Um, compensatory programs are those measures which uh, are aimed at compensating the impacts of the collapse that are not subject to mitigation through uh, reparation. Um, and you see some provisions about that in clause on page 563. Well, there's an issue about whether indemnification is reparatory or compensatory. No, no, no. Well, I'm not sure there is. But well, again, I'd like the references to that. I've, we'll, seen we'll, what, I've seen what Mr. Michael said in his statement about yes. uh, reparatory meaning actually mostly what in English we would mean by indemnification, that is to say compensation for losses. Yes. I, had, I hadn't picked up where, where, if at all, that was challenged by anybody. But you'll give me the references. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the references, my lord. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but whether or not there is a, a limit per se, what you will find is there are, there are funding limits for Renova itself. Uh, on a year-by-year -year basis, so it's not like... Uh, Is that what you're about to show us? Yes, I will show well, you. Why not go? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you'll, you'll see that in uh, 
If you look at clause 232. Sorry, clause two, I see. Sorry, Go you on. were taking us to page 563, I thought. Did I, did I mishear you? Yes, I was going to show you 563. Sorry, I got, I got slightly diverted. Uh, so 563 was, uh, is where there, there is a description of the, 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 what is reparatory and what is... But which, which, just which paragraph? So, so paragraph 7. Yes, I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and then, um, but if you look at the, if you look at page five seven three, there is a reference to compensation in, yeah. in, in clause eight one b, compensation and indemnification of the impacted, um, and then um, clause on page five seven five. You can see there obviously reference to compensation. In the context of the uh, coordinated negotiation program. Um, and uh, so far as um, the limits are concerned, if you go to page 653, clause 232, you will see that the um, <clears throat> foundation will allocate an amount of 240 million per year for a period of 15 years from 2016 um, in respect of the performance of compensatory projects and measures. Um, and um, there's a, a separate amount of 500 million for in respect of water treatment and, and sewage connections and so on. And then you can see the, the total of 15 times 240, which is 3.6 billion, uh, referred to paragraph 2 on page <coughs> 653 in respect of projects of the compensatory nature. Um, and um, you will see there's an exception, or there's a potential, there's potential scope for increase uh, in, um, in clause 232, paragraph 1, um, Roman 3, in the hypothesis provided in clause 203, paragraph 3, which if you go to that on page 643, page, sorry? Page 643 um, deals with the situation where there is a proven failure to execute uh, or the negligent or defective execution of some of the measures associated with the reparatory programs, in which case there might then be a, a determination by the independent audit and the CIF uh, of the need for further measures, which may include the need for further compensation in case further compensation needs to be paid, that is then outside of the limit in, in clause uh, 232. Uh, um, and, um, uh, and you will see also that in clause um, 233, that um, amounts that have already been blocked. Sorry, uh, on page, page 653, clause, forgive me, 233 on page 653. Amounts have already been blocked into court or, uh, or deposited um, by the companies are treated as uh, part of the annual contribution of 240 million. So it's deducted essentially from that. Um, and you will see that in clause 234 at the top of page 655, uh, that. Um, in the event that Renova's expenses exceed the annual limit, the excess is to be recovered by three equal portions from the annual budgets for the following three years. Sorry, we're grinding very small here. Do we need to see all this detail? Or what's the... uh, well, I, I'm just, I'm just, I just want. I, I have a funny point. This is all summarised in in Professor Rose's. Yes. Professor's well, I, I can uh, skip all paragraph three three five to three three eight. Yes. What I'd like is any other references in the expert evidence in 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 response to that. Yes. Please. Well, I, 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 I will. Um, we will get the references again, just by way of a review. The, the, um, the, the, there are funding limits on Renova itself, so limits on what Samarco is to put into Renova, and that is in clause two two six on page 60, 650 and page six hundred and fifty one. Samarco is to make defined contributions. Uh, to Renova over a six year period. Um, um, you, you may have seen that, and I apologize if I'm trading something you already know. Um, 
it's not a blank check. <clears throat> and um, so you can see the three amounts in 2016 to 2018. And then um, you can see um, on page 652, clause 231, paragraph 1, uh, also lays down a minimum and a maximum, a minimum of 800 million and a maximum of 1.6 billion for the next three years to the end of 2021. So I think on my calculation means that that's a total of um, 9.2 billion uh, for the six years from 2016 to 2021. Of course, in theory, nothing would stop um, 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 the shareholders of Samarco to put more if they want to, uh, and that may or may not be what they what they have done. But to the extent they do so, it's actually at their discretion rather than provided for in the TTA. Now, so am I being no, slow here? How, how is Renova funded otherwise than by Samarco? We've seen that the amount that Renova has to spend, presumably yes. the amount has to be funded by the shareholders. Yes. Is equivalent to that. Well, it, it's Samarco that uh, has the obligation, the sort of primary obligation to fund yes. uh, Renova in, in um, clause two three six. Well, don't give me the details. Just give me the overall overview. I, I, I'm, I'm making a very simple and probably stupid point, but I just want to be explained. You've shown us earlier that there are amounts that are com which Renova is committed to spend about over fifteen years. Yes. Yes. Who is going to fund it to spend that money other than Samarco? Oh, of course, it, it, it's got to be Samarco. Yeah, well, exactly. So, what, what, why do we need all the detail of how Samarco funds it? The basic point is Samarco has to fund it. Yes, but but it's also it's con it, it's it's foreseen that Samarco may not be able to. In which case, BHP. Yes, I see. Oh, all right, that's the point. Vale and BHP Brazil would yes, then thank you. fund. Thank you. Uh, I hadn't picked that up. Make up the shortfall on yes, a 50 50 basis, and that's what's 237 of the TTAP. That's page 655. But is this all part of a submission that there's a real uncertainty or a real risk that Renova will not be sufficiently funded to meet full redress? Is that what, is that what this point goes to? It's, it, yeah, it's part, of, it's part of an overall submission that the means of redress that are available from Renova are subject the limitations in the TTAC. So, in other words, therefore, subject to uh, all of the limitations, including the funding limits in the TTAC. But the, 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 no. I mean, that, that's the agreement. I mean, of course, I, I, they, uh, no doubt they'll say, oh, well, a mere detail. How much do you need? We'll, we'll put more in. I don't know. Maybe that's what they're going to say. But <laughs> which then raises the question whether we are supposed to conduct ourselves on the basis that uh, we have to rely on the discretion of Renova as to whether or not um, what they are offering is uh, <coughs> adequate or not. Well, we don't know whether the funding limits are adequate or not, do we? We don't, well, no, we don't know. There's I mean, no, there's is, been is, no, this, is this no. exercise really just going through um, Rosa 1, as I inadequately put it, um, uh, identifying what she, what he says are the multiple shortcomings in what TTAC and GTAC have to offer? Yes. I think that's, it's, that's really what it boils down to. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm wasting time going through that. In fact, I, I'll, in the light of that, I'm just going to no, no, I mean, I skip over GTAC oh, because okay. you've probably read that. You've read what Rosa says about it. You've read what DBA says about it. And uh, Well, I'd like the references, please, because I, well, I don't think this is... Um, it's not always clear. Well, I, yes, I, I'm trying to strike a balance enough. because I, I, I was conscious of my Lord, Lord Justice Underhill's comment that you're not necessarily... Uh, understandably, because you, 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 you've had limited time to read uh, as familiar with the underlying detail as, as obviously we are and, and, and but obviously that I have to manage my time as well because but I'm glad to see that obviously if I'm told I'm wasting the court's time because the court already knows what the point is that's great because I can then move on to the next point. Well I think I can summarize it this way we have read the evidence it wasn't I'm afraid clear to me that, 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 that this was the, or the exercise you were doing was simply um, giving us the references which were in Rosa I think you, I think we would have cut you short earlier if I'd realised that's all, what, what you were doing but there is 
my Lord's point, which is the really important point here, that uh, there are disputes um, between the experts on some of these points, this being one of them, uh, and it is not easy to pick up um, exactly what points are disputed uh, and uh, we would like, as it were, a table of all disputed points going to this yes. and the references. Yes, yes. That's a fair point, and, and as I say, we'll, 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 we'll um, provide that table. Um, but um, I, I think I, if I can uh, um, uh, stay at, a, at the, the level of an overview, as it were, um, um, what is whatever view one takes of the uh, sufficiency of the TTAC? the package in it, if I can put it that way. One thing is very clear, um, and that is that the MPF did not consider um, uh, that package to be uh, uh, sufficient. Uh, we know that because shortly after the execution of the TTAC, uh, the MPF launched the 155 CPA, uh, which um, uh, 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 claimed, essentially, uh, an amount and required the companies uh, to provide guarantees and securities for an amount of essentially 17 times more than the 9.2 billion uh, that um, uh, Renova had been contemplated to be funded for between the years of 2016 to 2021. Um, uh, and um, that then led to the GTAC, which again recognizes, in my respectful submission, universally, as between the parties to it, including the Brazilian companies, that there was a need to renegotiate the original package and to improve the programs that had been initially set up under TTAC. The detail of that, obviously, and the extent of any renegotiation or improvement, we don't know, but there certainly there can't really be any doubt in my respectful submission that, that um, uh, the basic proposition uh, that what had already been agreed was insufficient uh, was agreed. Yes. And so GTAC is going forward on the negotiating hypothesis of full redress for anything that's recoverable under Brazilian law. Is that right? Yes. And, and, and funding of that. Yes. So things have moved on from TTAC. Yes, absolutely. Things have moved on. Uh, and um, and um, uh, that, no doubt, is, is a good thing, obviously subject to what will actually happen uh, at the very end of the renegotiations. Uh, and we don't, because obviously... Uh, 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 sorry, sorry to slow you up, but where does that lead your point that the funding arrangements under TTAC fell short of what was needed? Well, because they, they, they fell short of what, what, what was needed because it's... It, 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 things have moved on now. We're under GTAC. But well, we don't know. What, the, what, what are the new funding limits? What are the new funding arrangements? Well, the, I think we don't the, know. I think the point that Professor Didier makes... I may have got this wrong. But as I understand it, the point that Professor Didier makes is that the basis for the renegotiation set out in GTAC, uh, well, I haven't looked at it myself, is expressly a basis on which there is to be full redress to the extent of any liability under well, Brazilian law principles. But that's just an idea. Well, that's just a principle. Well, well, maybe. We can if it's a principle that's followed, there will be no funding limits. Yeah. Because they'll spend what has to be spent. Well, th that's assuming they are able to agree. Uh, agree what? That's assuming that they are able, ultimately, to agree upon something that they all agree is full redress. But we don't, number one, we don't know whether they will agree that. And number two, number two, it doesn't follow from, from the fact that the, the MPF may be willing to agree with the Brazilian companies that sufficient redress has been achieved by whatever deal they make. It doesn't follow from that that the claimants have to accept that. No, well, of course, I accept the second point. That's, that's obvious. But, um, or indeed the 58, for example. You, you've, been on a funding, you've been on a funding point. So far, and but it, but the funding but the funding has moved on. The principle is that that which there is a liability to to, to pay on a full redress basis will be funded under GTAC. We've got, we've the, the MPF has got his way in in saying 
all those arrangements were unfair and didn't provide for sufficient uh, funding because there were limits on them. But, but fine, you, you can assume, if you want to assume, that uh, because they've said so, uh, and they've agreed that as the base of their negotiations, therefore, the deal will... Uh, it's not clear to me whether you're saying that simply because they've agreed that, therefore, ex hypothesi, if there is a deal, it has to be, uh, as a matter of law, as it were, full redress under well, Brazilian I, law. I certainly wasn't putting that. I don't think my law was either. Well, uh, fine. Yeah. Well, well, no, what, what I was putting was, whatever the deal is, <laughs> as to what does or doesn't amount to full redress, the overwhelming probability is, because this is what GTAC contemplates and what no doubt the MPF would insist on, is that that will be sufficiently funded by uh, whether it's Samarco in the first instance or, uh, failing that, the two Brazilian shareholders. Yes, yes, I, I accept that. And so the time yes. we've spent on whether the limits of funding under TTAC were or weren't sufficient strikes me as time wasted. I'm sorry, I, I understand. I, 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 but but you, you will understand that the only point I'm making about funding is that, obviously, from, from the perspective of the claimants, um, uh, uh, and in terms of um, looking at the matter overall, and in the absence of, of any knowledge of what the renegotiation will produce, it's a relevant consideration that up until now, the funding of Renova has been constrained, uh, it may be that as a matter of discretion, it's relaxed, uh, but we don't we don't have any control about that uh, over that. We don't have any certainty as to the extent of any relaxation, and and although we are aware of the principle of of the renegotiations, we don't know what <coughs> that would mean in actual numbers, uh, and, and and that's relevant. I, I thought that an important point in Professor Rose's approach was that. Contrary to what you've accepted from my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell, was that the basis was not um, full redress as a matter of Brazilian law, but full redress under GTAC, full redress under TTAC. And that was Professor Rose's big point, I thought, but I may have misunderstood that. So he keeps saying, hang on, let's be clear what we mean about full redress. We mean uh, when, 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 when um, GTAC is not talking about full redress as a matter of Brazilian law. It's talking about full redress as agreed um, by, well, presumably by the funders of under GTAC. Um, but I, I may have completely misremembered that. Isn't, isn't there an important conceptual distinction here? TTAC provided for a, a uh, scheme with limited funds. GTAC, in principle, uh, but then the details how it's actually to be spent uh, has to be worked out over a number of programs over a number of years. GTAC doesn't do that. It simply says we will pay full address. I thought, like my lord, that that meant yeah. full address yeah. according right. to uh, Brazilian law. What you don't know, and Professor Rose's point is, we don't actually know what that will turn into. And therefore, we can't say whether it will be what we regard as full address according to Lord, I'm very sorry to interrupt. It might help, but it's Rosa 462. Thank you. It's full redress under Brazilian law. Thank you. Yes, I think... Whether that's there's so in negotiations or... I, I won't even look for the moment, but just to follow that point up. So it's all, it's all your second point. All this first point about funding is beside the point. It, 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 it is the, the point you're making, which I've certainly guessed and dropped for some time, is... You may not like what they think is full redress according to Brazilian law, and you may want to go to a Brazilian court and find out, or an English court and find yes. out, applying, Bra applying Brazilian law. Got that. Yes. But all the stuff about funding <coughs> is really beside the point, isn't it? Well, I, th I think the funding is part of the overall picture, because, because, because in the absence of knowledge of what the renegotiation is and what the new, any new funding limits might be, all you have... Uh, to, to be going by as to what may be available under the programme is, is, is what's currently set out in the TTAC and what may be uh, uh, any excess over that that Renova may be uh, uh, able to um, offer uh, if it's funded by, uh, by, 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 by Samarco and its shareholders. It doesn't go beyond that. I accept that obviously once uh, uh, 
programs have been renegotiated and have been agreed to be improved, one assumes that the funding for that will be then made available. I think that one could assume that, but, but then the next point is, well, we don't even know whether that will be sufficient. And the question is, can the court here and now say that these claimants are behaving abusively because they want to pursue their claims against um, two different defendants higher up the chain who they say are directly responsible for the collapse. That's really the bottom line. And we say that there's, those two things are fundamentally uh, different uh, because there is simply, uh, 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 in the absence, unless you're able to say, uh, here is uh, the fund that you can readily have access to that gives you more than, than you can ever achieve in England, unless you're in that position and we're not, then uh, the rest is just speculation uh, and, 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 and an un unsafe basis for striking the claims out. But, but on, on references, and, and, and just so you, so you know at least what the evidence is, can I ask you uh, to look at, not now, but uh, and we'll put it in the hard copy bundle, at Appendix 2, to our first instance skeleton, the 32-page appendix, but it summarizes the evidence in relation to Renova and what we say are the problems with it, um, uh, and uh, it was referred to in our in section C two A and section C four of our first instance skeleton. But it's also said that in appendix two uh, to our to, to that skeleton, and it, it identifies basically the the limited scale and reach of the programs and and various um, other uh, uh, problems. Um, I think I've. I think we've probably. I've probably said enough about um, uh, Renova and and, um, and 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 we say that essentially that we 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 are not required to accept uh, that what is av available from Renova is sufficient or adequate, whether on an individual claimant basis uh, or on a on an aggregate basis. Um, uh, and and um, uh, the claimant's decision to seek separate redress from the respondents in these proceedings uh, can't be treated as abusive when they have genuine and legitimate concerns about the adequacy of the compensation available from Renova. Uh, and the system itself contemplates that they are not required to accept what is offered, and they are free to pursue their court claims. It would have to be a very strong thing. It's a strong thing to say that, therefore, in the absence of a detailed comparison between what can be obtained through Renova and what can be obtained, could be obtained through the English proceedings on a claim by claim or claimant by claimant basis, it would be a very strong thing to say that, therefore, a claimant's decision uh, to take his or her chances through a separate court action against two different defendants uh, is behaving abusively. It may be that we'll, it will turn out that we were well, we, we unwise. Have yeah, we do, you have, we do have this point. Right. Let me move on to the next point, which is the novel system. Uh, and again, I, I may be at risk of being told you've already got all Well, we'll be, a, we'll be a bit... If you tell us the point to which you're going, we'll tell you whether we need to speed, speed up. But yes. Well, so, start, so, start small and we'll see how we go. Yeah. So well, let, let's just have a, so, so just just so you know that so Renova over, over over time has basically has run the PIM program. It provided PIM General and PIM Water. So that was their general compensatory and indemnification program. Uh, and, um, and and uh, and there and issues arose as to the regis registration uh, for that program uh, and as to the. The, the criteria for indemnification in relation to that program. Uh, and that led to uh, uh, priority, priority Axis 7, as it's been called. The prior, Priority Axis essentially deal with different aspects of Renova's, Renova's programs. You might have a Priority Axis about uh, water quality or about whether the, this, uh, uh, whether uh, some treatment plant should be improved or not, and things of that kind. One of those axes was about compensation and indemnification of impacted persons. Um, and, um, and in the context of that priority axis, some local commissions of affected persons, that was a new uh, uh, 
form of body that was created by GTAC. Some local commissions uh, who live in the relevant areas deci decided to take matters to the 12th Federal Court, effectively bringing their complaint in relation to the compensation and indemnification program. And that then led to certain decisions from Judge Mario, resulting in probably the main decision of the 1st of July 2020. So that was a decision under the umbrella, essentially, of the Renova programs, specifically the Priority Axis 7 of, of those programs. Uh, and, um, and if we look at the, the judgment itself, uh, which is um, Bungle G, tab 22, see that the judge describes the context of the decision on page 1049. Um, it explains how the claim is brought. Historical decision, contextualization of this claim. Uh, this claim was brought to this court by the commission of affected parties, etc. Uh, after almost five years, um, and it identifies the topic um, uh, concerned which is the subject matter of the uh, claim being the topic of indemnification for the damages arising from the collapse. After almost five years of the disaster, the affected parties cannot wait any longer. Promises and speeches from the institutions involved. I repeat, the legitimate affected parties cannot wait any longer. And then if you go further down, um, he describes how after final paragraph on that page, after several negotiation rounds, which were not successful in achieving consensual, solu consensual solution um, and after various challenges by the defendant companies, etc. Uh, you can see there what's set out. Um, I think we can skip over the, um, the quotation, although it describes some of the alleged problems with Renova um, in relation to the registration process. Um, and um, uh, and then, so, so, so that sets the scene for what he says uh, is the problem, and, and, uh, and that then leads to, um, I'll probably pick it up at the bottom of page 1050, the legal system, whether procedural or administrative, was not and is not prepared, I think, it's, I think it means uh, able, to deal with claims from disasters of large magnitude, such as the rupture of the dam, uh, the social and environmental and social and economic damages reach more than 700 kilometers, etc. Et well, we have and we have all read this. I'm great. It's a crucial so decision. Gonna, the key um, so point, key point I want to make is if you go to page 1057, see that he describes what he d d d um, um, uh, defines as the indemnity system, or what we now call the novel system. And the critical point you will see uh, is on page 1058 under the heading, well you can pick up the first point um, where he says at the top of page 1058 that the relevant parties through their lawyers can adhere or not to the terms of the damage matrix, so the point about optionality and choice, uh, and you can see the point, the same point being made uh, by him under the heading of principle of autonomy of will, optional adherence by the affected parties. Uh, and, um, and he makes it very clear uh, in the, th the three options they have, they can participate in the PIM program, they can file their own individual action in local courts if they want to, or they can take part uh, in the indemnity system and benefit from the damage matrix. So that, that's the point. I know I've already made that, so I'll just move on. Uh, but, but, but again, I, the point I want to make out of this, in relation to this system, is this also, like the Renova system, is optional. Uh, and, and in my respect, it's mission, therefore, an important feature of the question whether if claimants such as these claimants decide not to take part in that process, uh, it is to be said that they are behaving abusively. And that, in my respect, the mission is... Uh, a, um, uh, 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 a, a, a 
strong thing to say and, and simply not right because they had a choice. Unless, as we can come back to the same point, it can be demonstrated on a claimant by claimant basis that what is on offer under the damage matrix is simply uh, as much as or more <coughs> than could ever be obtained in England. And that is simply not the position that we're in. Can I just ask you, Nestor, you came back, the references as to the extent to which the novel system is available to claimants. I understand your point that where available, it may not be adequate because the matrix may not provide uh, for the uh, losses of a particular washerman or fisherman or whatever it may be. But this is in Beecho Guandu, I don't mind the mispronunciation. And I've seen from Mr. Callis' third witness statement what he says about the extent to which, at least at the date of that, it had been applied more widely um, to other claimants, resulting, I think, in him saying that it now covers 99.3% of claimants, or at least 99.3% uh, of the areas in which 99.3% of the claimants are to be found. Um, Yes, I did. And it's been extended to some extent to more categories of, of claimant, and there's been a development which means there's no longer a registration program. The problem, at least for the claimants who are, who are English claimants, because the date is such that all the English claimants now qualify. But do you take a point that there are claimants uh, who might form a separate category for whom this? simply isn't an answer at all, either because they are not within the relevant category of artisans, fishermen, whatever, <coughs> or because they come from an area uh, which doesn't have the rough justice system extended to it. No. Yeah. Well, I, 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 it certainly doesn't cover, because, because it's under the umbrella of the Renova regime and, and ultimately the TTAC, it doesn't cover um, the, the large claimants. Uh, there are also so in other words, those that are not individuals or small and macro businesses. There may be issues also, I believe, I'm, I'm, I don't have all the details at my fingertips, but there may be issues about cutoff dates uh, because there are a number of, there have been a number of challenges, I believe, by the companies themselves in relation to cutoff dates. I, I, I perhaps we'll get the references for, your, for the court in relation to the evidence uh, that identifies any issues in relation to the comprehensiveness of the, the novel system uh, as it now stands, or as explained in Mr. Callas Phillips. Yes, because I, I think Mr. Callas said it also does refer to a number of aspects under which the extension is subject to challenge and appeal. Yes, he does. He does. Um, and, and I think he exhibits a, a number of uh, decisions as well, which... Um, well, give, give us the references. I <laughs> promise to read those. Yeah. Um, so, so, that, so, so I, 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 th th there's one specific point in relation to um, the novel system, which is that they rely on the fact that um, uh, about 9,800 claimants have signed releases as quid pro quo for claiming under the novel system. Uh, and um, in, in my respectful submission, obviously the sign of releases by 9,800 can't possibly justify the strike out of all of the other claims. The evidence claims. is the terms of the releases. Uh, th I think there is an example, a sample yes. of an indemnity agreement. Right. I have but that. I have didn't find that, but I probably didn't look in the right place. I, th yeah. I, th I think there. I, I think there is. It's, it's in one of the exhibits um, uh, to Mr. Calafillo's. Um, yeah, well, I, I probably just missed it. Um, or his first, his only statement. Um, but perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll get a reference to that. But, but the short point is. Obviously, if they have, the, if in relation to those defense, uh, those particular claimants, they have a defense based on the releases, they can obviously plead that, uh, and uh, and depending upon whether there is or isn't argument as to the meaning and effect of the releases under its uh, uh, governing law, there may or may not be an issue, and it may well be that those claimants, having signed the releases, uh, having elected to do what they did, um, will have to discontinue their claims. Uh, I, I don't know. And, and the application 
for, for strikeout was not made on the basis of the releases. That, that, that's simply something that's been developing, as it were. Um, uh, and there's no evidence, for example, directed, uh, no evidence of Brazilian law directed to the meaning and effect of the releases. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so that certainly would be one of those points where obviously a question of abuse uh, remains open in relation to those claims. If they continue to pursue their claims in England, they, they've actually been released uh, uh, um, pursuant to those um, waiver, waivers and releases. Well, it wouldn't be abuse, but yes, there might be. Well, I mean, it, there'd be, but there'd well, be more it, specific it, reason. It, it may or may not. Well, yes, I'm. Yeah, okay. yeah it, there would be a defence. There'd be a defense. There'd be knockout yeah. blow. Yes. Yeah, whether you call it abuse, whether you call it, you know, well, it might be abuse because you may not have the same parties. It may not be a release which that these could be abused by by the end. Yes, by sort of a stop or a direct appeal. Yes, well, it depends how it's termed, how it's phrased. Exactly. So it may even potentially depend on 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 the situation of the people who who've been. Given the releases, I don't know that particular circumstances. Um, the, the reference for the release is H on Opus H5 Tab 4. Uh, but we'll make sure it goes in, into hard copy. Yes, so that you have it. Yeah, we won't look for it now. Um, so the, the third means of redress. So, so again, all of the points I've made about Renova, in my respective submission, apply equally. Uh, to um, the novel system. Proceedings in Brazilian local courts is the final means of redress that they rely on, and they rely on the possibility of claims against Renova, uh, as well as uh, Samarco, and the, my short points here are, first, uh, the, the, the proposition, uh, we can't rely on a claim against Renova as a means of redress, because the claimants have no cause of action against Renova with respect to the collapse. Uh, Renova played no part uh, in relation to the dam or the collapse uh, and has no liability as a polluter directly or indirectly and is not a shareholder of Samarco and hadn't even been formed at the time of the collapse. There's a dispute between the experts as to whether the TTAC and the GTAC afford impacted persons a direct right of action against Renova. Um, we'll give you the references for that as well because that's another area of disputed uh, uh, Brazilian law, but none of the terms of the TTAC or GTAC provides for any such right of action. Moreover, as we know, such rights of action against Renova as those documents provide for uh, are optional. Um, uh, 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 and so um, that, that, is, that hardly improves the position. Um, so far as um, uh, claim against Samarco is concerned. Um, now, there's a preliminary distinction to be drawn here as to how the argument um, that they're advancing is to be interpreted. If the argument is that the claimant's claim should be brought in Brazil rather than England, then that would be a complaint about forum uh, rather than a complaint about the inherently abusive nature of the claimant's claims. Uh, and, and that argument, for the reasons I've already given, is not a proper argument uh, for abuse. Um, if the argument is that only Samarco should be sued and nobody else, which is, I think, what they essentially mean, then we said the, uh, that argument is beset with a number of uh, fundamental difficulties. Um, this is where I do want to introduce, uh, as briefly as I can, the evidence in relation to the judicial reorganization of Samarco, so that I can I can then so that you can look at it de bene essay, which we've agreed or can look at uh, look at any fresh evidence that's disputed um, de bene essay, uh, and so that I can then make my submissions to how it's relevant to the case. Uh, well, I'd rather you put <laughs> it the other way around. I would rather you said first what it was you were trying to prove, and then show us the evidence. Well, the, the, it's, the, the point is relevant because it goes to... So what point is relevant? Uh, the, the, the judicial reorganization evidence is relevant to whether or not the claimants uh, are being unreasonable in not treating a claim against Samarco as being, in and, in and of itself, a sufficient form of redress. Because Samarco 
is burdened with huge indebtedness. There is a raging argument between its credit. Uh, I understand. Just to, sorry, just give me a single legal proposition, and then then develop it with with the adjectives, if you like. The pro the proposition is what it no, is not unreasonable. The, the, well, the, the, let, let me let me let me let me um, express it in a slightly um, uh, more logical. The JR evidence is relevant to the question whether court claim, a court claim against Samarco in Brazil. Sorry, take, I'm taking this slowly. Is relevant to the question <coughs> whether a court claim against Samarco yeah. can be considered to be a form of full redress for the claimants. And <coughs> And is, is the uncertainty about that because the administration casts doubt on Samarco's solvency or ability to meet an established liability, or is it because the process of establishing the liability of Samarco is in some way hindered by the process of administration? Both. But certainly, the, that's definitely the former. but as well as the latter. But then isn't it, it is then just the solvency point in a, in a particular guise, isn't it? it it's, it's, a sol it's a solvency point, but in the context of the judicial reorganization of Samarco, which, 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 which essentially, I mean, it, it's essentially uh, on a different scale because we can see uh, how some the, the, the position of Samarco has developed and how it stands now, basically, and what is being proposed, including, including in relation to the payment of claims related to the collapse, because the plan deals with that as well. It's relevant uh, to understand how the plan proposes to deal with that. To give you an overview, it, 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 it proposes that Samarco will fund another billion dollars, up to another billion dollars, of any Renova-related contributions, but subject to its cash availability. And only when that limit is raised uh, would the shareholders then provide an excess. But there is no commitment in that plan from the shareholders, i.e. Vale and BHP Brazil, as to how much they will contribute. It simply provides that to the extent they contribute, then their contribution will be converted into notes, basically, that are repayable, subordinated notes, I believe, uh, that, are, that will be repayable by Samarco uh, in accordance with the terms of the notes. Um, and um, and um, and so um, it's um, it's central, really, to to even how going forward the Renova programs will or will not be capable of being funded, quite apart from anything else. Uh, and what is more, the creditors have completely rejected that plan because their position is that claims arising out of the collapse of pre-bankruptcy credits. They don't accept the, the, the company's argument that, that contributions to Renova should be treated as being post-bankruptcy credit and therefore uh, 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 not competing with earlier debts of uh, all of the other pre-bankruptcy debts of some market. Companies totally reject that proposition. Because, because that's being used in order to, to force them to accept a 95% haircut on their debts, which were also obviously completely legitimate pre-bankruptcy debts, uh, 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 but um, uh, prioritizing, as it were, uh, the, the claims uh, related to, to the collapse uh, on the terms of the plan. So that the fundamental workability of the whole thing going forward is completely up in the air at the moment. 
Uh, yes, I see. So you've introduced this as relevant to the uh, uh, third form of uh, alternative relief that is relied on by the respondents, namely proceedings against Samarco. But in fact, you've just built in that it's also relevant to the viability of Renova. Well, it, 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 it does raise serious questions as to how the funding is going to work going forward. It, it does relate to that too. Um, uh, although I... It doesn't really, does it? Because it, so far as Renova is concerned, there's always a fallback funding obligation on uh, on Vale and uh, and uh, HP. Why not got that right? Correct. But as part of the reorganisation, what is contemplated is that these shareholders will only contribute after that billion limit has been reached. Um, on my reading of the plan, I, maybe I'm going to be told that I've, I'm, I've misunderstood the plan, but on my reading, that, that is what is provided in the plan. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and so it, 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 rose, it raises at least a serious question mark over well, how is the funding of Renova actually going to take okay. place? Well, that, that, that's been helpful as giving us an introduction to um, why you want us to, to want to take us to the details of the evidence about uh, the Samarco JR. Um, it's uh, 4.27, and I don't think it's an exercise worth... Um, Starting on now. I would agree. I, we'll we'll, um, I, we'll, we'll, we'll um, see, see you tomorrow at some um, at ten. Thank you. Cool. Rise.